Hi everyone, so we're just gonna wait like three minutes um, for more people to come in and then Jeffrey will start the presentation. All right, I think one more minute, and I think we should get started. Okay, um, start sharing. All right, let's get started. Um, which screen am I sharing? Okay. Um, this is going to be an East Asian symposium um, on East Asian languages. So a brief introduction. Um, what is this talk going to be about? Um, it's going to be discussing the language families that exist in the Eastern Asian region. Um, we're going to be talking about a little history and how ling these languages relate to each other and some, you know, basic, basic information about them. Uh, this talk will be relatively short. It will be around 10 to 15 minutes, aside from your usual like 30 minute talk. Um, that's because we're just be covering the general information. Uh, each one of these language families does have enough information to get its own presentation and many more. Um, so yeah, uh, language families. Uh, we'll begin with Koreanic. Um, it's spoken upwards of 75 million people with the main broad main speakers being Korean. Um, Jeju is another, uh, some people have considered, some argue as a language because it is not mutually intelligible with Korean. Um, along with that, there are a few others, which, um, is in a bit of art, which not universally agreed on whether it is its own dialect, its own language, or et cetera. For example, uh, Yukchen. Um, uh, for Japonic, we have, um, as you can get for the name, it mainly li has links to Japan and Ryukyuan, uh, spelling R-Y-U, 
um, KUAN, um, spoken upwards of 126 million people. Uh, it links to Koreanic because it has a long history of interaction. Um, around the first millennium, first millennium, people have said that uh, it came from the archipelago. And there has been a long, long line of influence of the two language of language from Korean and Japonic, uh, as mainly by their shared vocabulary and some shared syntax. Uh, namely, the vocabulary similarities being near more environmental things. Um, Sino Tibetan. This is perhaps. Um, the, one of the biggest language families in terms of purely the number of speakers right behind um, Indo-European. There's around 1.3 billion speakers and mainly has the two branches of Chinese um, with those Sinitic languages and Tibeto-Burman. Uh, there were proposals to links of other language families, though the connection was not conclusively demonstrated. Um, as we'll see later in this presentation, some people have argued that it has links to uh, Karadai um, and Hongmian, but these have not been properly substantiated to be universally agreed on for the linguistic community. Um, we, now we have Austronesian. This is perhaps one of another one of the big ones in this presentation. There's around 386 million speakers and according to Ethnologue, it is the second biggest language family in terms of the actual number of languages with 1,257 1, languages right behind Niger, the Niger Congo language family. It resides mostly on the Indonesian and Malaysian islands um, because of just the large diaspora and the history that surrounds it, especially with the trading routes that occurred in around the, I want to say, 16th to uh, 18th century. Oh, as we can see that, oh, if we go on the next slide, uh, actually, it's, how do you go before? Never got the hang of this. Oh, Austronesian, um, it has, uh, actually, wait, no, next slide. Uh, we Now we have Austroasiatic. There are around 117 million speakers and 168 approximately, 100, approximately 168 languages that reside in it. You can see that covers um, a lot of southeastern Asia and some parts of northeastern India. Um, this is a large spread. It is not the only language family, as you can see, that governs the southeastern Asian um, region, as there are others, as we will see. Uh, but this is a big one. Uh, now we have Karadai. Um, this goes by many names, uh, depending on who you ask. It, um, its name does come from the two branches of Karantai, although it, it is a very tonal language family, which means that it's, most of the languages that exist in here are very tonal, which is very common among the uh, Eastern language families. It encompasses also a lot of Southeast Asia and Northeast India. And also a bit of Southern China, as you can see from this map, where we have Thai, Central Thai, Northern Thai, Fukra in here. Um, there's, 95, there's 95 languages around here and around 93 million speakers. Um, a lot of this is comprised of Thai and Lao, which is from Thailand and Laos, the main language is spoken there. Um, finally, we have Hong Mian. Uh, there's around 3.7 million speakers, and it has the branches of Homoic, Homoic, and Minic. Um, it is by far one of the most tonal uh, language families in the world. Uh, there's one language. Let me dig through my notes again. Um, uh, the languages Longmo and Zongdi Hmong have as many as 12 distinct tones. And um, it's sometimes known if you, in the Chinese transcriptions, is Mao and Yao, um, as this encompasses a lot of southern China, central southern China, 
and some parts of Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, that's the end. This is a very, very brief talk that will hopefully get you more interested into going a bit of the specialties. For example, um, you could definitely do a big research project on something like Sino Tibetan, a Austronesian with such a large history behind it, um, Austroasiatic and Koreanic and Japanic, and Japonic exploring the links between those two. Um, here are the sources and final notes. Those were my final notes. Uh, thank you for listening to this brief presentation. Uh, if you want to open up to any further questions or. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. So if you guys have questions, you can put them into the chat or just say out loud. Um, yeah, and I'll also link to the so this event is organized by Ling Week, and I'll link. Sorry, and I'll link to the, <laughs> um, to the Ling Week Discord in the chat, which is a place where you can ask Jeffrey about more things and um, get more resources for linguistics and meet other teens interested in linguistics as well. Um, yeah, so I'll link that in the chat in a bit. But yeah, I'll soon be um, and ask him. posting my slides in that Hangout server. Um, again, a little bit more advertising for the server. There are certain there are different language channels where you discuss different things, such as historical linguistics, um, social linguistics, and among other things. And there is a dedicated Chinese channel also. So that's cool. All right, it seems we, oh, oh there's a question. Um, yes, I forgot to mention this in my introduction, but uh, if any of you don't know me, my name is Jeffrey Huang. Um, both my parents are Chinese and they both speak native Mandarin and I grew up in a household where both Mandarin and English were spoken um, um, around the same amount. Um, how is Mandarin mutually intelligible, intelligible to other Chinese dialects and languages? Um, that really depends. Uh, the Chinese dialects is a very long range of Chinese dialects, um, but they're definitely not all mutually intelligible. For example, if you take um, Canton or Cantonese, uh, a native Chinese, a native Mandarin speaker would not be able to, um, it, they wouldn't be able to understand clearly or fluently as far as I can see because uh, I can't understand Cantonese. <laughs> um, yeah. I hope that answered your question. Uh, yes, yes, it did. And may I ask one, one more? Of course. Uh, uh, you said like, um, regarding the spoken form and what about the written form? Because I, I once read that like, uh, uh in written form of like, uh, Cantonese and Mandarin, all these Chinese dialects, there, there are very like mutually intelligible, like the characters, you know, is that true? Oh yeah, um, I didn't do that much research into the writing forms. Um, again, uh, they are the same geographically and there were a lot of historical relationships between them. So um, I'll have to get back to you on that, on the mutual intelligibility on their writing systems. One thing is to note is that um, on that topic, in Taiwan, where they have traditional Chinese characters, and in China, they have, um, I want to say, simplified or just reformed Chinese characters because of the Cultural Revolution that of the Communist era. So there's a lot of variations within that family in terms of the writing systems. OK, thanks. Um, Jeffrey, one more question in the chat. Do you have any recommendations for learning Mandarin Chinese? I was accepted into a program to study it and I'm a little nervous. Uh, yeah, Mandarin Chinese, it's, I'm glad to have learned it natively. Um, I couldn't imagine what it's like to learn it as someone who hasn't been speaking it from a young age. 
what I would recommend is just not only just the regular you know, practice studying the tones, the phonology, um, but you should really try to listen and try to consume a lot of Chinese media. Um, I'm not completely fluent speaker. And the way I've also been trying to supplement my learning, is just go on things like Chinese telev television shows where they have English subtitles, but they have um, Chinese stubs where they speak in Chinese. And that'll really help you differentiate a uh, learning between like the subtleties with different tones because that's um, pretty hard for people who have who are, for example, uh, English speakers. Um, so my advice would just to have a lot of auditory um, exposure. Okay, um, if that is all the questions. Uh, okay, thank you everyone for tuning in uh, wherever you are and bye. Thank you everyone. And you can ask more questions on the Discord to Jeffrey. Thank you.